Hello and welcome back to the MCC Brussels podcast. This week, we're going to be taking a look at why the European elite is so obsessed with the term far right. We're going to be looking a little bit into the uh, medicalization and the transformation of politics into therapy. And we're also going to touch on the revelations from the recent WPATH files. Now, to kick us off on the, the first topic we've got for this week, we wanted to examine something that I think really is maybe the most noticeable element of European discourse at the moment, which is the fact that every uh, challenger party right across the continent, anybody that seems to deviate from the EU norm, is immediately not just labelled kind of right wing, not just even labelled far right wing, but there's almost an inflation of terms going on where you kind of get upgraded from hard right to ultra right to extreme right, um, and eventually, of course, to being called a fascist. This for us is kind of not just concerning in terms of how it shuts down debate and discourse, but I think really exposes the way that our elites are unable to characterize the kind of problems that they're confronted with. Frank, you've been writing and thinking about this a lot recently. What have you made of this kind of inflation of terms to describe uh, the right in European politics? Well, I think language is really, really important. And they're using language uh, as a way of... Uh, scaring people of certain movements. Uh, basically, the more you uh, inflate the problem, the threat uh, posed by your opponents, the more you're able to make a link between uh, movements that you don't like and uh, the bad experiences in the 1930s and the Second World War, implicitly making a link between these movements and uh, the fascism of the 30s. The more you think you can uh, somehow succeed and, uh, and limit the damage. So it's very interesting that at, at the moment, Macron was fighting a very serious and difficult campaign against the uh, Rallyman National and is really behind the polls, has decided to almost adopt not just old-fashioned Cold War ideology, basically saying that the Rallyman National is a pro-Russian movement they are really, you know, Putin's puppets. Really talking about how these, this is a very dangerous far right movement. Not only simply doing that, but almost, you know, sort of basically saying that if you vote for these people, then you're not a, a, a true French person. You really are letting down the French nation. That these are people you mustn't take seriously. You mustn't talk to. You mustn't listen to. And I think the message of the far right. Is, is to switch people off, to try to switch people off from taking these women seriously and listening to them. That's really the, the main uh, objective of this. And to some extent, this has become normalized in some circles, but at the same time, a lot of people don't care anymore. When they hear the far right, it doesn't have the same resonance these days as it would have had 20, 30 years ago when the, when the label far right actually meant the far right. Yeah, I think one of the things that's becoming obvious is the way uh, in which ordinary people, as you say, are getting switched off to this rhetoric and uh, also kind of spe is, makes it very clear that you can see through these attempts because they don't really correspond with reality. Uh, Bensa, we were chatting earlier about this kind of fantastic article in the Financial Times from Martin Wolf, who you might think of as the kind of chief ideologue of European centrism. But uh, the, the way these terms get bandied about, especially fascist, is, is something really concerning, is it not? Um, I think that <clears throat> this article is indeed very superficial and it's uh, even uh, not serious. I mean that uh, they put in the definition of fascism and, and far-right fascism or ultra-right fascism every, uh, a lot of things that without uh, saying that is it an extreme uh, thing or not. They're saying, for, for example, those who are attached to traditions, mm -hmm. th these can be fascists. <laughs> So it's, I don't really take this uh, article seriously, and also there are some uh, some figures which are which are very false in the, regarding polls and parties uh, uh, in the uh, in the European political scene. But I would like to add to to what Frank said, and I I very much agree with it. And maybe I have a more Hungarian perspective. And also some Western perspective as well, because I used to live a lot uh, in France. Mm -hmm. And I know that the stigmatization of far right of fascism works quite well in Western Europe, maybe less well than 20 years ago, but still it works. In Hungary, uh, on the contrary, it doesn't really work 
because we are very much vaccinated against this kind of uh, communication tools. Because during uh, uh, and before the change of the region, during the communist regime in the you know the last century, and also after the change of the regime in the in the nineties, uh, the left wing and the former communists used to use these tactics of, of of stigmatizing everything which which was on the right, which they do not agree with. To say this is the mm. far right, this was the so-called fascist danger. Mm. Uh, some people who believed in the nation were the fascist for the communists and also for their successors um, after the change of the region. So we do not really care whether they say far right or, or fascist right because we know we know that this is only a kind of a political communicational tool and a game and without any meaning. Yeah, Frank, to pick up on uh, one of those points that I think came out in this article was that the term or the use of the terms associated with far right, extreme right, fascist, whatever it is, it seems that part of the point of them is not just to kind of close down political opposition, but also to put into question some of the kind of foundational norms that people who may consider themselves conservatives, but may just not, that they might identify with to do with the nation, to do with tradition, to do with history. And it seems that they're trying to bandy all of these terms together into this one label and dismiss them all at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So, for example, if you take all the so-called fathers of the European Union, you know, people like Schumann, you know, people like De Gasperi or Adenauer, who were like the main founders and motivators of the European Union, the old EEC in those days, their values would have been, would be today called far right because they are, first of all, strongly Christian democratic. Secondly, they have a strong commitment to tradition, to the tradition of Europe. Uh, they believe in the traditional family. And all the values that, in a sense, defines their outlook today is pathologized as being far right or extremist or even fascistic. So this is an amazing development that has occurred because in the space of 40, 50 years, you have a complete emptying out of the meaning of the traditional vocabulary. A new kind of uh, language develops where the meaning of right no longer resembles what it would have meant in the past. And the fact that far right, which 50, 60 years ago would have been applied to Nazis mm -hmm. and genuine fascists, has now migrated into territory which uh, in, in 50 years ago would have been considered centrist conservative mm -hmm. and that's that's the irony and that's the tragedy of the nation nature of narrative the political narrative that prevails in the European Union. Yeah and Ben so one of the things that goes hand in hand with this of course is that, that, that they pathologize everybody to what would be considered the right of political discourse but those kind of traditional parties they represent it kind of by the EPP maybe in the European politics they become ever ever more not just kind of centrist but almost left wing so at the same time for the fascist kind of declaration shuts down genuine right-wing opposition, but also turns the traditional conservative parties into kind of caricatures of, of themselves. They no longer have their old content. Yeah, that is a very exact analysis. And I wanted to say that uh, the political compass has changed. That's what Frank told as well, that uh, uh, if you have the axis, you know, when you, when, when you draw up the political scene and in mathematics, you have this notion of origin, you know, in the middle. And what happened is that they put this uh, origin on the left. So if once you put the center to the left, you push it to the left, then everything uh, which, was, which used to be on the right becomes the far right because it's further away from the, the center, which is on the left. I, I hope that it's, uh, it is understandable, this, yeah. this mathematics uh, example or analogy. Uh, and this is exactly what happens uh, and what happened uh, with the EPP as well. Uh, which went, went uh, which followed the left and went very much on the left, uh, e exactly in the two t between 2019 and the uh, Nova days. They went very much on the left, so that everything which was on their right became uh, seemingly even more right wing than it mm -hmm. used to be. But there is also another phenomenon, uh, which is um, uh, which is this interesting uh, question of. Uh, using the far right is very much negative. Uh, it's not fashionable for center right parties. Mm -hmm. Let's say if the EPP qualifies for this, it was never 
uh, fashionable for them to vote together uh, with the right, more right-wing parties like the ECR or the ID group. It was like, if they did so, they were very much criticized to cooperate with the far right. But if the socialists vote together with the far left or with the communists, it, it, it has no uh, wave in the news, it has no weight, there's no problem. It's not shocking. This is also a kind of political framing. And uh, nowadays in the European Parliament, we can have communist uh, uh, people uh, speaking up in the name of, of this ideology. Uh, and it is kind of mainstream. So it's very interesting for me because in Hungary, we have a different point of view and we have a very um, sensitive approach to the, to the communist era, which used to be a dictatorship, a uh, communist-run yeah. dictatorship in the country. Yeah, I think one of the things we're going to uh, watch with interest is after the uh, European parliamentary election results come through, and if all of these parties that they've really branded as kind of far right, extreme right, fascist do relatively well, it's both going to be a kind of huge shock to the system in Brussels, but also potentially paves the way for some quite kind of authoritarian responses to what's going on. So that's something I think we need to kind of keep a lookout for. And because they, until now, the quarantining of the so called right. Well, what they call far right, uh, has been relatively successful. Uh, there are some examples here and there in local government and in certain towns where it hasn't worked. But now you get a sense that uh, this is kind of gradually breaking down. And you, could, you see that in Sweden, where the Swedish Democrats, although still kept out of government, are nevertheless part of this governmental uh, nexus. And you can see something very similar happening in Holland where they cannot keep builders out indefinitely. Somehow, they're going to have to make some kind of deal there. Uh, Italy is a very good example where Maloney was able to actually form a government. The, the big crunch question is France, because if the Rallyman National continues to do so well, it raises the question of what, what's going to happen if it becomes the dominant party, the, the, the party that ought to and, and should be able to elect the president there. If that happens, how is the French state going to react to Mary Le Pen or, or Bardella or, or someone like that, potentially becoming the leading figure of, of the state in France? That's going to be uh, something we have to really, really look at very carefully. Because if that happens, then in effect, France, through this uh, single act uh, of, of democratic decision-making, can force the, the far right mongers on the defense. Mm -hmm. They can no longer just simply say far right and imagine they can get away with it. So the second topic we wanted to take a look at today was the kind of seemingly incessant rise of therapy culture and the kind of medical imperative that seems to underline a lot of contemporary politics. This is kind of really obvious both in, we had a conference uh, on the family not so long ago and we were discussing how these kind of themes really undermine interfamilial uh, relationships we've discussed it in terms of education as well uh, but frank i know you've been looking a lot specifically at the way in which this is kind of robbing young people of a sense of agency or any chance of making an impact in the world this is a theme you touched on a lot what's been catching your eye recently well what i find really interesting is that there is the assumption uh, that uh, human beings uh, in so-called democratic societies are not really citizens, but they're patients, and we have to treat them as if they're patients or potential patients. And when you look at the kind of elite narrative that's occurring, you find that, and this particularly kicked in at the time of COVID, but existed beforehand, in a situation where they began to medicalize political life and politicize health. So public health became a a political weapon with which they could make make decisions. And that was like the, the new normal that emerges out of the COVID. Now, the other day, I was looking at some uh, documents that the European Union has published. And what's interesting about these documents is that, you know, when they're talking about culture, for example, or cultural policy, they very often link cultural policy to health. So the idea being that if you have this or that uh, cultural project occurring, kicking in, it's going to make people feel good. They're going to help, help their well-being. And it's almost as if uh, culture itself becomes increasingly uh, a form of therapy. So that the reason you know, why you have nice theaters or you have uh, museums and galleries and various other kind of uh, 
events is not to kind of question what's going on or to disturb people. I mean, that's what art used to be all about. It's used to make them feel, hey, I need to go away and think about this. Mm -hmm. It's much more about making pe people feel good about themselves. And if you treat people into this prism of psychology, then my argument is, is you, 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 make, you render them powerless. You dispossess them of their capacity for independence and the capacity for, in a sense, being able to take risks and make things happen. And for me, uh, it is a tragedy that European culture has embraced these California therapeutic values and is Europeanizing them all the time. Now, and Arta, I mean, what, what does this do to politics when the whole kind of vocabulary is colonized by terms from therapy and kind of uh, Frank's touch on how it robs people of agency or dispossesses them of the ability to maybe change their surroundings. But, but what do you make of this kind of inshi uh, incessant shift to therapy in politics? Um, and so, I mean, Frank already touched on this, but one of, one of the things that keeps happening is this sort of like politicization of culture. And, um, and, a, and a therapy culture is a way for us to think about that in, uh, in, sort of in, in a more medicalized form. And then we have to try to find ways of, of filling in or the void and the void here one way to fill it in is through politics and through a sort of political ideology and through association and and oneness with them identity with them and the other way to do it is through um you know a sense of medicalization so we don't have a problem it's not our problem you know it's easier for us to see that there is a uh that it's not under my control there's something maybe physically wrong with me yep. that i feel this things. yep uh, Frank, I know that an uh, area of particular interest for you is specifically what this does uh, to the transformation of young people. And we've looked especially in the area of education and how people are, young people are almost cultivated not to try and expand their horizons and broaden their sense of perspective through engaging with new ideas or historical epochs, but instead to almost stay within their shell and become kind of very comfortable with that. What does this do to a kind of whole generation of people? And what, what, what problems do you think that poses for kind of the possibility of moving society forward when you've got a generation of young people who don't really seem to know how to go beyond themselves. Well, we, what we really are talking about is a, a narrative that they learned in school, a narrative that fails to make a clear distinction between being ill and being healthy. And it's a narrative that assumes that being mentally disabled or mentally disturbed is, 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 is a norm, it's is, is quite normal. And therefore, what happens is that as young people grow up, instead of dealing with the challenges of life, like failure, disappointment, being rejected uh, in an existential way where, where it's seen as, okay, this is life, this is tough, uh, but I got to learn to deal with it through talking to friends and, and through, you know, in a sense, learning to live uh, with pain. Uh, they interpret these normal existential questions through the prism of psychology. And, the, and the, a diagnosis becomes a medium through which these kinds of experiences are interpreted, which is why you have a situation where in the United States, 40% of, of Gen Z kids have seen a therapist. That's 40%, almost half of them. You know, you have a situation where 10% of Gen Z kids have got ADHD. You know, you, I mean, essentially, American young people are being medicalized to the point at which they really are walking patients. And what that does is it basically uh, weakens them, it disempowers them, it makes them wary of taking risks, uh, it makes them wary of experimenting, of, of, of struggling with ideas. You know, I've, it, you see this in a university where uh, instead of struggling with the ideas, people are looking for ready-made answers, kind of uh, you know, off-the-shelf answers. So what that leads to is, is, a, is a situation where the younger the generations are, the more medicalized they are, the more psychological problems they have, and the more they complain about the fact that life is difficult at a time when arguably life, in certainly Western societies, has never been as easy for people as it is now, where in fact we have far more resources available to get on with life, and nevertheless, they all uh, are encouraged to believe that they have, the world has never been as difficult ever as the one they're facing in the here and now. Yeah, Arta, I think, I mean, one of the things this brings out maybe is the degree to which people rarely have that experience of kind of overcoming themselves and going into 
uncomfortable situations and learning and growing from them because as you kind of said earlier they stick within this kind of comfortable framework of therapy what what do you think this makes for i mean even basic things like personal development or your sense of identity when everything is conceived of as as therapy yeah i mean uh, it, it's certainly i mean I, I agree with frank that there is a sort of a crisis of of individual or personal agency that you know we uh we try to then latch on to these different things um most a lot of it medicalized uh and, and, and it does get worse with generations but i do think that there is we also think that maybe they'll be able to do it if you're if you're not sort of coddling the american mind as as, as uh height calls it um but i i think it's a bit deeper than that i, I think the, the these are sort of the medicalization in a, in a way a sort of a pseudo uh, rational explanation for the reasons um that this is happening instead of looking at the sources and the real source is a sort of a loss of meaning, a crisis of meaning rather than, and so, you know, we keep looking for cures. We keep looking for med medic medical um, answers to the, these problems. And we also on the other side think that maybe if we don't, um, and this is where the question becomes, if we remove the medicalization, could individuals actually, or youth actually find a way to overcome this crisis? I personally think that because these are uh, so structural and historical conditions, uh, specifically unleashed by modernity. Um, it, they tap into something deep that's human and existential, but they're unleashed by modernity. Solving them requires fundamental changes to our structures of our social life, and that's something that is not very comfortable, it's more complicated. So we like these more packaged explanations and answers that both do a thing of sort of separating or distancing the, the agents, the, 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 our use, from, from the sources of, of trouble, but at the same time, doesn't really address the fundamental questions. Yeah, I mean, the fundamental question is that uh, if you cease to socialize young people uh, through a medium of uh, philosophical and cultural values that uh, have served uh, society for generation after generation, but you give up on the basic values such as courage or prudence, you know, sort of, or, you know, sort of pra the practical wisdom that the Greeks talked about. And instead, you, t you basically flatter young people with psychological values of validating them, then you end up with this problem. So medicalization is really a symptom yeah. of a more fundamental underlying problem. And uh, that's, that, that, that underlying problem is one that people are reluctant to address. Because if you addressed it, then you essentially had to completely rehaul and rework the way that we educate young people and particularly rework the dynamic between generations, the intergenerational transmission of ideals would have to go back to or go forward to something that's qualitatively different than what goes on now. Yeah. And so our third topic for today is something that I've wanted us to address uh, head on for a, at least a couple of weeks now, and that's the revelations contained in what have become known as the WPATH files, which are a, a series of things which I really uh, urge our listeners and watchers to go and check out. But basically, I mean, to summarize a very, uh, a really quite harrowing series of reporting, things have been alleged for a long time about how the use of and medicalized ways of transitioning, especially young people in terms of cross-sex hormones and other things associated with trans, the transgender ideology, that, that actually the doctors themselves who've been prescribing this and leading this and uh, kind of developing treatment patterns for this have themselves had huge concerns about actually what they're doing to especially young people, but have kind of plowed on regardless. One of the most interesting uh, things maybe underlying all of this is the way that as much as we might think of this as maybe a, an American import or an American phenomena, lots of the kind of work in actually setting out the parameters of this was done uh, by, it was developed in Holland, uh, this kind of famous Dutch treatment protocol. Um, this is something we've been looking at in the EU because lots of countries all across Europe have been changing the way that they offer recognition to people who want to change gender and also provide uh, therapies and, and treatments to them. I think this is very relevant to the topic we were talking about before in the way in which young people are kind of, young people especially, being encouraged to interpret their everyday problems through the lens of therapy. And in some cases, this lends uh, weight to people wanting to maybe transition or change gender. What have these revelations kind of hammered home for you, Frank? Well, that there's a very fine line between uh, the cultural norms 
that support therapy culture and the ugly experiments that can easily emerge from them, where children are not just simply socialized in a particular kind of a way, but then they become uh, the targets of medical experimentation. And this is like the most extreme form of what we call medicalization of, of the body and individuality. Because what, what we've done in a sense is we've turned young people's existential insecurities about their place in the world into medical problems. So we first of all encourage them to socially transition. And it's important to realize that social transition is really a, a gateway into something far more serious. There's, there's no fine line because once you're down that road, then the next step is the logical, physical trans transition that, that takes place. And uh, the medical profession, or at least section of it, has responded to it by creating the medium to which this can be done by providing uh, you know, various treatment plans to make this happen. And what's interesting is that in a world where we are, we are usually very careful and risk averse about new treatment, where we exercise a lot of precaution, far too much precaution, according to my thinking, in this instance, we throw caution to the wind entirely mm -hmm. and allow this, this kind of mad experiment uh, to flourish and to be then taken up in other societies within Europe. I think this is a really good illustration of the tragic consequences of, of, of the problem that we're talking about. Yeah, I think one of the kind of real revelations in, in, in the files was the degree to which, despite pretending for uh, all, almost several decades now, that the kind of treatments that they were encouraging uh, certain young people to undergo, such as taking uh, cross-sex hormones or uh, what they call puberty blockers, um, that they pretended and had tried to amass a kind of fake series of evidence at least had almost no uh, effect on young people. You could just kind of turn puberty off and on like a light switch, that actually this has got like really serious effects on young people in terms of their sexual development, their physical development, and also their psychological development. There's a kind of strand of thinking, isn't there, Frank, in this that uh, almost wants to suggest that, uh, that the young people maybe shouldn't even have to go through puberty, that the, the kind of coming to terms with your body is something that can kind of not be a struggle that young people have to go through naturally or organically, but it can just be done through therapies and through drugs. Yeah, there is that. There is a, a, an attempt to find an instant solution, or at least a medical solution, uh, to what are very difficult uh, psychological and existential problems. But in many ways, I mean, what this reminds me of, uh, without exaggerating, are some of these medical experiments that used to take place politically motivated medical experience on black people in the in the deep south in the United States or on Jewish people under Nazi Germany and then some of the, the experiments that occurred in totalitarian Soviet Union. This is a maybe a, a more modest form of that, but to me uh, there is a very clear link here between the medical ex experiment on children and the political ideology that underpins them. And, and we know that when those two intermesh, there's going to be trouble. Yeah, I think the way in which the coming together of medicine and ideology here has been hugely damaging. And it also is why I think we need to show uh, both a lot of courage in confronting this, but also not just assume that these revelations, as damaging as they are, are going to kind of put an end to the way in which uh, people are kind of forced onto or put onto uh, various medical therapies because it's so strongly tied with the ideology i think these uh, these kind of networks of doctors and networks of activists uh, would f find it far easier to kind of move this slightly behind public view than they would to actually seriously take on the kind of the revelations and, and the public outcry this has caused absolutely and i would expect that uh, despite the outcry these procedures will continue and they will escalate because the imperative uh, of uh, medicalization that's driving this, the whole confusion about you know men and women and the biological uh, issues to do with with sex are so deeply embedded now that so it were so wholeheartedly committed to challenging the conventional distinction that it's what they call the binary between man and woman that this is going to be pushed to the fore.
even more. So I would expect more more of these uh, horrible experiments kicking in and 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 impacting a larger and larger number of young people. Yeah, well, this is something we'll be certainly on the lookout for here at MCC Brussels. We know this is not just uh, some people like to pretend a purely American phenomena. We know that I think lots of things are changing very fast right across European countries. So we'll be uh, taking a kind of stern look at all of this as 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 the weeks and, and months progress. But for now, uh, we hope to see you at one of our events very soon. Uh, this has been MCC Brussels. Uh, we hope to see you soon.